سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد so as we continue with the first hadith of Adab al-Mufrad, Bab al-Awwal, Chapter 1, Bab al-Qawlillahi Ta'ala, the chapter of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa wassayna al-insan bi walidayhi husna. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Surah Ankabut that we have enjoined upon mankind that he should be kind to his parents. And in this chapter, Imam Bukhari, the first hadith that he will narrate is hadith which we read last week. This hadith, starting from قَالَ سَمِعْتُ أَبَا عَمَرَ الشَّيْبَانِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى يَقُولْ حَدَّثَنَا صَاحِبُ هَذِهِ الدَّارِ The Aba Amr says that the person of this house narrated this hadith to me. وَأَوْمَأَ بِيَدِهِ إِلَى دَارِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ what page are you on? We are on page 43. 43? Sorry. We are on page 43. Wa ila Abdullah. He pointed to the house of Ab- the house of Abdullah ibn Masud radiallahu ta'ala an. Qal sa'altu nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Ayyul amali ahabbu ila Allahi azza wa jal Now before we start this hadith there's one more thing or continue this hadith there's one more point that I would like to bring up The Quran teaches us that we should make dua for our parents and the dua which is in the Quran is Kama Rabbayani Sagira. That Rabbirhamhuma Kama Rabbayani Sagira. That O oh Allah have mercy upon them just the way that they have brought me up. Now what I want to bring to our attention here is the fact that the word used in this dua is Kama Rabbayani. Rabbayani. Now, if we look at this word, we'll see it also has a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rabb. Rabbil Alameen. We always make this dua, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, my question that I think we all should think about is, what is the connection between Rabb and Tarabba Ya Tarabba Shay In Arabic there's a saying that that Alma Ya Tarabba Ul Ambat that the water brings forth Ambat vegetation in in some language we, we say Tarbiyat the word Tarbiyat or Tarbiya comes from the same Fail or verb as Kama Rabbayani. What are we getting at? What I want everyone to draw their attention to is to see this connection that we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of everything. But, but what does this word Rabb mean? In order to understand the word, we have to look at how the Arabs use this word. And they use this word to mean to bring something up, to raise something, to culture this thing, to give it what it needs so that it grows. And this is the exact duty of the parents. This is the exact duty of the parents. That the parent has to give tarbiyah. Tarbiyah. In the time of our mashayikh, every student had a murabbi. A murabbi was the teacher who trained him and taught him and brought him up. So this dua that, that the Qur'an is teaching 
that Allahumma rahamhuma, Rabbi rahamhuma, kama rabbayani sagira, the way they brought me up. This same word is used for Rabbil Alameen. Because at the end, when we put all of the effort and we try our best, the outcome of the child is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we can do as much tarbiyah as we want. And we train them the best. We teach them the importance of salah. We teach them all the adab. We teach them, we teach them, we teach them. But yet look at the state of the son of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. He was a son of a prophet. Did he not receive tarbiyah? For sure he received tarbiyah. But hidayah, مَنْ يَحْدِ اللَّهِ فَلَا مُذِلَّ لَهُ وَمَنْ يُضْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ Whoever Allah guides, no one will lead him astray. But whoever is led astray, then there's no one that can guide him. So this job of tarbiyah is in the hands of the parents. That is why one hadith tells us, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ that every son of Adam is born on fitrah. His natural disposition, his natural state is that he's a Muslim. Every child born. That he believes in one Allah. That, but what happens is, his parents are the one who change him. And make him into a Yahud or a Christian or what it may be, a Majusi. So the, the actual job of bringing up the children, we learn from this word, Kama Rabbayani, is the duty of the parent. So right away we can understand that why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always connects وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Let's look at this verse. Your Lord has ordered, what is the word here? وَقَضَى Rabb, the same word. Your Lord has ordered that you do what? Allah ta'budu illa iya. You only worship Him. And wa bil walidain. Why bil walidain? Because they do the tarbiyah. It is the walidain who train us and give us adab and train us how to be. So before going into uh, this this hadith again, uh, I just thought it was important that we discuss. What is the connection between the word Rabb and Tarbiyah? That in order to be good parents, we have to be doing Tarbiyah of, of, of our children, inshaAllah. So now looking at this hadith, let's actually look at this hadith again. Qal, he says, who is this? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, <coughs> سألت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أي الأمل أحب إلى الله عز وجل. In this hadith, Ibn Masood is asking the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم that which deed is most beloved by Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Now there are a few ways that we can understand this hadith. I'm going to give you three ways to understand this hadith. Three ways to understand this portion of the hadith. There are three ways to understand that which action is the best deed. Three ways. The first one is that the question is general. Number one is that the question is general. It means out of all the deeds, what is the best deed? It's general. The second, there's an objection to this first one though. In other ahadith, we see that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that there are other good deeds which are the best a'mal. You'll find other hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the best a'mal, iman billah. You'll find other hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the best action is that action which is consistent. Okay? You'll find other hadith where it's worded differently. So why so many different, different hadith if it's general? So here come the other two explanations of this hadith. The second 
is that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is just like your children. Imagine your son comes to you, one of your children. This child is really good in school. He comes home, he jumps right on his homework. You know, he starts doing projects two weeks before deadline. He's really into his studies, but he never cleans his room. Never. No matter what you do, he never cleans his room. Now, you have his sister on the other hand, who's a little lazy with the schoolwork, waits to the last night to tell you, oh, I have a project, we have to go buy supplies, and you're saying, why didn't you tell me a week ago? But, when it comes to cleaning, her room is spotless. You never even have to say a word. So now if your son comes to you and says, just like imagine, like make believe he would come to you and say this. <laughs> All right. Dad, what's the best deed I could do for you? The son. What are you going to say to him? <laughs> are, are, are you awake? <laughs> what do you want from me? <laughs> it's not pay week right now. I get paid next week. No, you're going to say to this son, you, you need to clean your room, son. The best deed for you is to clean your room. Now, your, her sister hears that. Oh, the best deed? Cleaning the room? I'm done. No more homework. <laughs> That's it. And I have a hujja. And it's sahih. I heard it myself. It's not even da'if hadith, it's sahih, I heard it myself. <laughs> so now when she's not doing her homework, you, you say, you know, uh, I've been speaking to you and now you totally stop. Yes, because ahabbul a'mal, the best deed you said is cleaning the room and alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me with that. <laughs> so now through this example, all of us can now understand this question when Rasulullah Sallallahu was asked and he gave different responses he was looking at the different characteristics of the person asking the question so the second one if you're making notes according to the need of the questioner the second one would be according to the need of the questioner that what are we answering the question is why does the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi say different actions are better the second reason why would be because the questioners are different. So the Prophet ﷺ knows that this person is good with his parents. But he tells him, As-salat ala waqtiha. For you it's salat ala waqtiha. So this is the first understanding. Now the third one. We all know that this Islam did not happen in one moment in time. The Prophet ﷺ lived over a time period. And Islam was going through different stages, correct? There was a time when the Muslims were very weak. There was a time when the Muslims had strength. There were times of security and peace. There were times of war. There were all types of different situations. So some ulama say, that this question was based on the time period when this question was asked. If it was the time of peace, maybe the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, no, the most important thing is Salah ala waqtiha birul walidain thumma al-jihad. But another hadith will say, what's the most important thing? Al-jihad fi sabilillah, defending our families, defending everyone. So, likewise your children, the same way, we can use the same example. That your child when he's 8 years old, he asks you, again, this is a rare situation, he says, what's the best deed? You tell him something. But later on in life, we're going through a different circumstance, he's going through different circumstance, he asks you again. You give him a different answer. So what if he says to you, you're confusing me, you told me this then, you told me that then. You say, no, there's different circumstances for everything. Likewise, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
when he said things, we have to look and regard to the time and when he, he said this thing. That is why a regular person who has not studied many hadith cannot just open a hadith book and say, we're going to do amal upon this hadith. Because you do not know when this hadith was said. And you may be taking this hadith not knowing there are 10 other hadith which came after this hadith which abrogate that hadith. This is called Nasik wal Mansukh. Okay? So these are, did everyone get that? So these are three reasons why. Uh, these are three reasons what this hadith, Ayyul A'mal Abdal, why are there difference of hadith saying the best deed? This is the, these are the three reasons why. Did we all get those inshallah? So now my question to you before we even read more of this hadith, what does this question that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, what does this question teach us? The question, not the answers. What does this question teach us? Ustazuna, Sheikh. You're not in it today. Five, five, that bass, inshallah. Study. Hard week of school, right? Relax. Inshallah. If the adults, the adults get very lengthy. <laughs> They can write their own shuruhat. <laughs> this hadith, inshallah, this question, he's asking what are priorities of life? What are priorities of life? It's a very simple question, but look what's behind it. He's basically saying, what's the most important thing in my life? What should be the most important thing in my life? What should I put first? Nowadays, we always have a conflict of our priorities. Um, just to answer the question, why the priorities uh, in my life? Uh, I gotta I hear think this one. It's, I think it's school or it's, uh, and Islam. Oh, no, no, not, not and. You have to give order. Uh, mm, Islam, okay, your there religion, you. school, uh, wait, wait, uh, your religion, parents, school, and then, and then your, and then your other family cousins. Okay, let's go through. Let's see. Let's see in light of the hadith, inshallah. Mashallah. Barakallah fiq. Namaftahaleka. So this hadith is telling us, inshallah, what our priorities should be. The order of our priorities. The next thing we need to understand very quickly is how do priorities affect us. How do the priorities that we set in our life, how do they affect us? The thing is, whatever we make number one priority, that thing will affect us involuntarily. Involuntarily. What does that mean? You, you. Involuntarily. No? Okay. Allah qadri uqulihim. We ha these priorities affect us according that these priorities affect us without thinking about them. They will automatically kick in. I'll give you an example. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, when describing the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, beautiful hadith, she said he would be busy in the chores of the house. This alone is a topic for the whole night. Many of us think it below us to do the chores of the house. No, 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 I have this work to do. No, no. Sayyidul Bashar, the best creation, our example, was busy in the chores of the house when he went home. This is an example for us. People do not know our Rasul. It is time for us to learn who our Rasul Sallallahu is. She says that the Prophet ﷺ would be busy in the chores of the house. But as soon as he heard the adhan, it was as if we ne he didn't even recognize us. Why? 
Because the priority now kicked in. When the Adhan came on, right away without thinking, the Rasul state was that number one priority now is Salah. Because the Adhan came. So how do priorities affect us? When we make our priorities set up, then without thinking, the priority will hit us. How do we know what our priorities are? Look at your family. Your family knows your priorities better than you. I'll give you a good example and I'll repeat this. The question here is, how do we figure out our priorities? Ask your family what your priorities are. Don't ask yourself. I'll give you an example. It's time for work. You're getting dressed. You're almost ready, ready to leave the house to go to work. Will your son or any of your family dare to come to you and say, Abu, Baba, can we go shopping right now? Can we go on a trip right now? Can we go to the beach right now? They will never ask you. Because they know you're going to work and your number one priority is work. But same situation, Salatul Isha, you're doing wudu. Will they ask you to go shopping? I'm on my way to the masjid. Yeah, but uh, can we go shopping really quick? They'll ask you. Why? Because they know it's not on the same priority list as work. I don't think we understood this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that you consider the shaitan is playing the role? Well. Let's... Uh, that's a, that's Let me make a side note of that. <laughs> I don't know who he meant by shaitan, but I don't want to get in trouble when I go home. So I'm going to sidestep that question and uh, we'll talk about that later. Who is doing that? It's not shaitan. It's because we did not set the priority. No one will come to you and say when you're going to work, let's go, can we go to the beach? No way. But when you're going to masjid, guarantee. Uh, can, can, can we go shopping? I know you're going. You can pray at home. You always pray at home. <laughs> That's what they're going to say. You always pray at home. Why today? Your, your priorities are not set. You may think my priority is salah. But your family knows your priorities better than you. So that is the next thing that we learned uh, from this hadith. Ayul A'mal Avval, this hadith is teaching us priorities. What should your priorities be? Now you can ask yourself, wait, what is my number one priority? Does it fit this hadith? Is my number one priority something totally different? Next thing. The first answer to this question, قال, As-salatu ala waqtiha. Prayer at its right time. The first thing that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is making priority is prayer. We'll discuss this. But I want to discuss the second part first. He says, Ala waqtiha. At its right time. Meaning, the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us right from the beginning the importance of time and time management. Managing your time. How, how did I get to there? Ala waqtiha means at its appointed time. What do we learn from this? Everything has a time that it should be done. It should not be that everything is done haywire. No. Whenever you want to be a successful person in something, you always have to have a schedule. This is something which is taught in the beginning of, of management. That you have to have a schedule. So in this hadith, just by nature, the Rasul Wasallam is teaching us the importance of time management. Ala waqtiha. The importance of time. Why is time so important? Why is time so important? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time wal asr. But any time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears, He says, وَضُّحَى by the morning time. وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا by the 
sun as it rises, one layli, one nahari, time. Allah is swearing by time. See, we as human beings, we can't swear by anything but Allah because Allah is the greatest. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, remember this point, remember this point. When Allah in the Quran swears by something, He's telling you that this thing is something of value. This is an important thing. Why is time so important? Let's say the average person lives 63 years. If you get that, we're just doing this for the sake of argument. Most of us don't do anything of benefit, most of us, until the age of around 12 years old. You're not even accountable. And you can go a little higher than that. Nowadays you have 19 year olds that don't do anything. But let's just say for the sake of argument that 12, 13 years old, you start doing some meaningful things. 63 minus 12, now what are we at? 51. 51. Okay, 63 minus 12, we're at, what are we? 51, correct? Now, between school and work, around 7 to 8 hours daily, almost daily, which is one third of every day, except for Sunday. Some of us even work on Saturdays. And I'm not counting overtime. We look for overtime. <laughs> okay, not counting overtime. So, eight hours daily, we're down to 51, that's one-third. That's how many years? Anyone keeping up with me? 17. 17 years, very good. Now from 51, you're down to how many years? 35. Your life is 35 years long. You were 63 years old, now you're 35 years old. 34. 34. I, we're cutting off all the... Uh, now, you have to sleep every day. What do you sleep? Six? Seven? Eight? <laughs> Ten? <laughs> Let's say, for my calculations, I said seven. Okay? So seven hours of sleep. So how many years is that? How many years of the life is seven hours of sleep daily? Huh? Who said it? He said it. Yeah, that's good. What did you say? 11 to 12. Right? 11 to 12. So now we were at 35 years. Take how many years off now? 12 years of your life you sleep. 12 years of your life have gone to sleep. We are left with 24 years. 23? Eating. I don't go by Fridays. Because Fridays, if I counted what we do here on Friday nights, then my whole calculations will go haywire. So I left that out. Let's say we eat two hours a day. I mean all the meals. And I included in this two hours washroom too. I'm giving leeway. That's about two years of eating. Two years of eating. From 24 years, you have now 22 years of life. Recreation. I stopped. 22 years now, how many hours of recreation? Leisure. As the kids call it, chillin'. <laughs> Excuse me for the colloquial phrases, but I have to touch base with the... We call it chilling. It used to be, we call it killing time. It's suicide. It is killing time, but it's suicide because your time is your life. So when you're killing time, you're committing suicide. Remember that. Your time is your life. So when you're killing time, you're committing suicide. Sorry to put it that way when you're young. Like, why are you killing it for us? But I have to do my job. <laughs> so we are 22 years of the human life of a person living 63. 
Most of us, some of us won't get to 63. And some of us sleep more than this and work more than this. And I did not even put in leisure time yet. And family time. How much time is left? How much time of this 63 years can you bring to Allah and say, I worshipped you? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah says the only create reason we created man and jinn was that he worship us. The purpose of our creation is that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of this time is going into other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The young man has an, has an objection. Voice it please. But, go ahead, you were going to say something. Okay, um, what, what, what were your 22 years like? I mean, you could, you could also, uh, you could also, you could also, you could also, um, like, work and pray. Uh, you could also, like, pray and, at home at school. You could do that. Of course, yes, yes, of course. But, <laughs> no, no, good point. Very good point. Very good point. I'll give you a, a better suggestion. I'll give you a better solution. There are some people who sleep is ibadah. There are some people who every bite of food they take is ibadah of Allah. There are some people who are in school studying and every word they read is ibadah of Allah. They change this whole scale into ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how? Niya. Your intention. When you go to sleep with the niyyah of gaining strength to do the ibadah of Allah, this sleep is a form of worship. When you eat food with the niyyah to do more worship of Allah, to learn more, to propagate Islam, this is worship. When you go to school to learn more, to propagate Islam and teach people and guide people, this is ibadah. All of this can be ibadah, but you need niya. It's very easy, but very, very hard. When you're going to work, if you simply make niya, that Ya Allah, everything I'm earning is for this livelihood of my family. Ya Allah, put barakah in this. But if the job is haram, how can he ever make that niya? If the food is haram, how can he make that niya? If he's doing haram at work, how can he make that niya? I told you it's very easy, but it's very difficult. So, as salat ala waqtiha. Again, what we were stressing here is the importance of time management. So now, how do we put these two things together? We see that through this time scale we just did, we don't have much time to work. Many of us have passed majority of these years. So for us, there's less than what's written on paper. There was 22 years for a newborn baby. The calculations we did were for the newborn. That in front of him, he has 24 years to put to the ibadah of Allah. We are well past this. So we have to make a schedule. If we want to be successful in anything, we have to manage our time. We have to manage every second so that it doesn't go to waste. Those who are business experts will tell you, time is money. Time is money. Why do they say this? Because they're equating time to the thing which has the most value for them. Money. So the thing which is most valuable I have to relate time to that because time is my most valuable asset. But for us, time is not money. Time is, is, is ibadah. Time for us to worship. Time for us to gain the ma'rifah of Allah. We only get one chance as we spoke in two Jumu'ahs ago about this saying, YOLO. We spoke about YOLO two, two Jumu'ahs ago. He must not have been there. <laughs> Because he's surprised to hear the Imam say YOLO. But YOLO is the Islamic slogan. 
You only live once, young man. So you have to live it for Allah. You only live once. So how do we make a schedule? We can only make a schedule when we look at this hadith and see the priorities. In light of this hadith, what should our priorities be? The first thing, as-salah. As-salah ala waqtiha. What is this salah? What is salah? Do we understand that when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, amul huzan, amul huzan, was when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam lost everyone he loved, and the people going against him were doing their most to go against him. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in a very sad state at that time. After this, Allah subhanahu wa taala wanted to give a gift to the Prophet sallallahu So he brought Rasulullah sallallahu for a trip, Isra wal Mi'raj. We'll discuss this some other time in detail. But in this trip, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was gifted something. He was gifted something. He was gifted salah. This salah was actually a gift for us. The same thing that we take as a burden, that I have to pray. No. You're blessed to be able to pray. You're blessed just to know how to pray. There are many people out there today that don't know what salah is and want to know. They want to know how to worship Allah. But this salah is a gift for us. So this salah, first and foremost, we have to understand, is a gift. Mi'rajul mu'min as salah. The way we connect ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gain inner peace is through this salah five times a day. Without this, insan goes haywire. See, we have to understand when it comes to I have to backtrack just a little for you guys to, for everyone to understand this concept that the salat are situated in a way where it's throughout the whole day so what does this show us this is very important if we write this down and try to remember this first try to remember it and then maybe write it down but remember this point the salats are situated in the way that they cover the entire day at set specific times. So because the times of salah are specific, what do I mean? Salat al-Fajr is at Subh Sadiq. And Fajr is Ba'd al-Zawal. And Asr is when the shadow reaches such and such length. And Maghrib is Ba'd al-Ghurub al-Shams. And Isha Ba'd uh, uh, al abyad. What does this? What did this do for our ummah right from the beginning? It created inside our ummah a care for time. There was no concern before as much that what time of the day is it right now. But through these prayers, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling us that no, make a schedule. I made a schedule for you. Now you make a personal schedule. But build your schedule around my schedule. I don't think... The, the prayers are at times. You don't pray when you want to pray. You pray when it, the time is there. That teaches our, our, our ummah the importance of a time frame. That there's a time for everything. It was us who created sundials to understand what time it was because of this prayer. So, when the, when the Qur'an says وَإِقَامَةِ الصَّلَىٰ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَىٰ The word here is iqama To establish the prayer. Not to pray. Allah didn't say that you have to believe in Allah, you have to pray, you have to pay zakat. He said iqamat الصَّلَىٰ 
establishing the prayer. What does it mean to establish the prayer? When we build our schedule, our daily life, from today on, when we build our life around the prayers and not the prayers around our life, that is iqam as-salah. This is the meaning of establishing the prayer. That your life revolves around these prayers. Example, brother, I'm going to meet you. What time? Ba'd al-Zuhr. Now there's no confusion. Wait, 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 what do you mean? Huh? No, we all pray Zuhr. Ba'd al-Zuhr. I'll meet you Ba'd al-Asr. See, the whole life is going around the prayer. Nowadays, we do whatever we want. Oh, it may be time to pray. And that is why we end up missing prayers. Because we figure I'll slide the prayer in wherever I get a chance. So the priority is not prayer. The priority is other things. On priority level two is prayer. So now we have to slide prayer into priority one. This hadith is saying no. Priority one is prayer. And then you slide everything else in. This gives us principles. This gives us things that we stand for. This gives us a code of life, a way to, to, to situate our daily schedules. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a day without prayers? For 18 years, I ask myself now, how did I live 18 years? What did I do all day? Do, some of us may remember the life before prayers. Now you can't fathom the idea because now the life is around prayer. We're going on a trip. Okay, we'll pray Fajr at this place. We'll be there at this time. This time we'll rest from here to here. Then we can pray Fajr. There, uh, there's a masjid here. We can pray Asr and that masjid over there. When we schedule our lives around prayer, our children understand that priority one in Abu's life is prayer. Not that Imam tells me this and then I go home and see dad. So what Imam is saying is true, but it's theoretical. It's not practical. What the Imam is saying is not practical. Everyone listens and does this, but it's not practical. When the parents actually do that, then the, everything becomes a practical thing. And it is practical. It's extremely practical. So what is this prayer in our life? It sets up our schedule first and foremost. Second thing is this. We all talk about establishing deen. Establishing deen. We want to put this committee together. We want to put this program together. We want to have this organization to do this. We want to have this organization to do that. I want to say one hadith in front of us. As-salat imadu deen. Man aqamaha aqam deen it's a very strong hadith the translation of which is this salah prayer is the foundation of your religion deen Men aqamaha, whoever establishes same word same word aqama whoever establishes the prayer aqama deen he establishes the entire religion woman hadamaha Whoever destroys this principle, Hadam ad deen He destroys the deen. What we're doing has grave consequences. What we're doing has grave consequences. We want to, our words say we want to establish deen, establish deen. Rasul is saying, you want to establish deen? Call the adhan, come to the masjid, come to, get a jama'ah in school, get the brothers at work together. Every job has three or four Muslims that are working at this one job. Every university campus has hundreds of Muslims. Every high school has hundreds of Muslims. Men aqamaha aqama deen. If we establish the prayer, then everything else in the deen will be established. Another important hadith, which is very important to understand. That awalu ma yuhasubu bihi al-abd yawm al-qiyamah as-salah O kama qala alayhi salatu was salam That the first thing that Allah will question us about On yawm al-qiyamah is our prayer 
So this, why am I saying all these hadith about prayer? It's a book of Adab al-Mufrad. Let's look at the big picture again, subhanAllah. What we have to do sometimes is back away and look at the book we're studying again. We are studying a book called Kitab Adab al-Mufrad. Correct? About Adab. And Imam Bukhari is studying this hadith with the importance of parents. But the first Quran ayah, we learned a ruling last week, which was La Ta'ata. Say it in English. What was the rule we learned last week from this ayah? Your parents are forcing you to, to change Islam, don't listen to Don't them. listen. So there was a rule. La ta'ata li fi al was the rule. This was the first chapter name that Imam Bukhari brought. A Quran ayah indicating to this rule. This is important because there are other Quran ayahs that he could have used here. But he specifically used the ayah which says in the background of it, La ta'ata li makhluk. Meaning this whole book will tell you how to deal with makhluk. But don't obey them if you have to disobey Allah. The, the way he's putting it together is absolutely beautiful. It's very well thought. And inside of this first chapter, the first hadith, he, he could have brought a hadith. There are a hadith where the first thing is birr walidain. But this hadith, the first thing is as ala waqtiha. Is it coincidental? By far, by no means is it coincidental. It's on purpose. He's trying to show us the importance of establishing our priorities. Al awwal fal awwal. The first thing for the first thing. As salah ala waqtiha. Waqtiha tells us what? You have to become someone who manages his time. All of your time should be organized. But I guarantee you now, when you go home and you sit down and you make a schedule that, okay, I'm going to do this at that time, I have to go to work at this time, okay, I'm going to do this, you're going to get stumbled. Because you won't, in your mind, you won't know what to put first, what to put second. That's when we do ruju back to Rasulullah Wasallam. That's when we go back to the Quran and find out what should be first, what should be second. Do mash mashwara, mashwara with, with those of knowledge. Ask them. How should we organize our day so that we get the most benefit? Does it go by, does every Ramadan come and you say, man, I didn't read any Quran this whole year. Well, I read a little, but not like I said I was going to. Every Ramadan comes and we say the same thing. Why? You didn't make a schedule. You didn't make a, you didn't make a plan to do it. It was just words. Until you put it down that this is how I'm going to do it, it's just words. You say, okay, I'm gonna read this much of this, I'm gonna read this much of this book daily. No matter what happens, I'm going to read for 20 minutes this thing. I don't care if whoever calls me, if Obama calls me, tell him this is his study time. You're gonna have to call him back later. It doesn't matter who calls, because this is the time for this thing. We have to become people that are firm. And if you do this, you'll get results. If you do this, then you'll get results. But this, this is only for people who are serious about actually accomplishing things. Whether it be in their dunya or in your, in, in your akhirah. So let's continue with this hadith insha'Allah. Uh, one, more, one more aspect I wanted to touch upon was actually the... Uh, the understanding of Salah in the eyes of Sahaba. The understanding of Salah in the eyes of Sahaba. And I'm only going to give one example for this. One example. Once the Rasul Sallallahu was teaching the Sahaba about the worst fitna ever to come to the earth, a Dajjal. Dajjal is the cursed one that will come the hadith tell us one of his eyes will be masha, wiped. The other will be like a grape. And he will come causing mass fitna. He will come to nations that have no food, no water, nothing. And cause all the resources to come forth. 
and ask them to believe in him and they will believe in him. This was the, the Dajjal that every prophet warned about, the Antichrist. And this being the worst fitna ever to come. The Rasul was explaining what will happen when he will come. And in this hadith, Rasulullah says about the time spent on this earth. He says something referring to that one of his days will be like 40 years and so forth and so forth. So most of us would be thinking, you know, what will he look like? What will we do? Where will we run? You know what the first question of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum was? They say, Ya, ya Rasulullah, that day that's like the years, how should we pray our salah that day? What does this tell you? They're hearing about the jaw, the worst fitna ever to come, in detail. That uh, he will come to a young boy and tell him to believe in me. The young boy will say no, he'll cut the boy in half. In front of everyone, he'll put the boy back together. Allah will only give him the strength to do this one time. When the boy comes back to life, he'll come back laughing. And he'll say, do you believe in me now? He'll say, no, now I believe even more your Dajjal that Rasulullah told us about. And the Dajjal will try to kill him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow him to be killed. At that time, Masih, uh, 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 the Mahdi, will be arranging the armies of the Mu'mineen in Damascus. Organizing Salat al-Fajr at that time, Masih uh, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam is coming down. Imagine the situation. Imam Mahdi backs up from the Imam. No, no, no. I can't lead now. Isa alayhi salatu wasalam says, No, I came to be in this Ummah, not a leader of this Ummah. How blessed is our Ummah that the Prophets want to be in the Ummah. Other Prophets want to be in our Ummah. Imagine how blessed this Ummah is. They're hearing all of this about Mah uh, Dajjal and they're asking, how should we pray Salah at that time? Where is Salah on our priority list? And we wonder why the children don't respect. The next thing is Birul Walidain. So just imagine that the st students are listening here. And they say, okay. Qultu thumma ayyun. Qal thumma birrul walidain. Do you know what thumma means? Thumma fil arabi lit tarakhi. Thumma means after that. After that. <coughs> if we are not establishing the prayers, or teaching tarbiyah to our children to establish the prayers. How can we ex expect stage two? The, the children should be honoring their parents no matter what. We're going to discuss that. But for us, for us, who should be doing the tarbiyah of the children, we need to understand that tarbiyah comes through action, not just through words. If, if we come and drop our child off, example, Sunday school, Salat al Zuhr, five minutes to Salat al Zuhr, we come, beep the horn, come, let's go. I just spent third, three hours telling him how important Salat is, and his father, the most beloved person in his eyes, just washed away everything we just said. Because now it's not practical. What the Imam taught us, what the Qur'an was saying, was theologically correct. But when it comes to real life practice, no, no, we have to get home, it's Sunday. What happens on Sunday? There's only one thing I know happens on Sunday. Football. Football. Yeah, well, let's go, <laughs> The words of the youth speak so clearly. SubhanAllah. Thank you, thank you. I didn't want to say it. Please, we have to back up what we do with our actions. Don't worry, highlight film will be there. <laughs> it will be there, guaranteed. It's recorded. <laughs> so 
So the point I was trying to make was that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, when they're hearing the great trial and tribulation of Dajjal, their only question is how are we going to pray Salah at that time? So that tells us how important it is for us and how we should value uh, and make Salah our number one priority. There are two more things. So then Ibn Masood said, I asked him, after I established the Salah at its what time? What is set number two on my priority list? Number two on priority list is to be kind, courteous, righteous, affectionate, loving towards our parents. What does it mean? If we look in the Quran, the Quran says, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ Do not even say uff to our parents. Do you know what uff means? Shoo ismu. Shoo What is uff? Ah, yes. Uff, exactly, very good. Uff doesn't mean when we say, no, I won't do this. Uff is when we show any type of, ah, oh, in front of our parents. This is the beauty of the Quran that it's telling us that not even everything they ask us, we should show them that we happily want to fulfill that thing. After all the ihsan and all the hardships that our parents have went through to raise us and teach us. Now the interesting thing is that this ayah of Quran says That if these two parents reach old age, one of them, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say if they reach old age? As people get older, we notice that sometimes it's more difficult to, um, how can we say it? Uh, the energy level goes down. Yeah, that, that's true too. Stuff with Allah. Their fuse gets shorter. Do you know what I mean by fuse gets shorter? They get angry fast. As you get older, you get angry fast. So a little thing will make you, you know. Subhanallah. I don't know if anyone understood what just went on right now. <laughs> so, as you get older, you, if this is for a message for the young, uh, the youth. The Quran is beautiful. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِمَّا When they get old, it's not saying when they're young, 30, 40, 30, 40, or maybe 50s, that or have patience with them. No, Allah specifically is saying, when they get old, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمْ فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمْ So, Allah is saying, at that time, don't say uff to them. That's the hardest time. That's when they complain the most. But we have to remember what they have done for us. We have to remember the tarbiyah that they have given us. The tarbiyah. This is very important. وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا But instead say a, a nice word to them. A beautiful word to them. And uh, as this is the chapter of Birr al-Walidain, there will be more about Birr al-Walidain. So instead of dwelling into Birr al-Walidain right now, there are more hadith which will explain this. So I'm going to keep going with this hadith. ثُمَّ أَيُّنْ قَالَ ثُمَّ الْجِهَادِ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Then he said, Ibn Masood said, what is the next good deed? He said, Jihad fi sabilillah. Jihad comes from a asal root word, jahada. Jahada. Inshallah. Uh, no, no, it's, it's nine o'clock, inshallah. We'll, we'll, we'll stop here, inshallah. Uh, we're almost done with this hadith. Means no, no, no. This topic has some. <laughs> I, I, doesn't everyone want to hear more about this topic, right? <laughs>
No, no, no. We'll, uh, inshallah. No, 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 no. Inshallah, we're going to call it. I, I had, the, I'm kind of fatigued from the whole week. I wasn't feeling too well the whole week. So I'll ask everyone's forgiveness, inshallah, if we can just stop at 9 o'clock, inshallah. We're going to pick up from right here, inshallah, next week. And we'll continue. Uh, I hope everyone has patience with me as we've been on one hadith for two weeks. But you can see the beauty of these hadith. Before we stand up, if there's any questions, then... Any, okay.